Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast. My name is Philip and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 37, Terence, The Bloom of Youth. Last time I concluded our look at Plautus and his works with a small diversion to Renaissance Europe to discuss his influence there, but also that of his only notable successor in Roman comedy, Terence. Now to move on to Terence properly, here are the details we have about his short life and his plays. Plautus died in 184 BCE, the probable year of the birth of Terence. That's a nice, neat pattern for us to see, but in fact his birth has been calculated at anything between 195 BCE and 184 BCE. Plautus, you'll remember, supposedly had a hard start in life. Terence's was even worse. He was born a slave, either in Carthage, in the modern Tunis in North Africa, or in one of the Greek colonies in Italy, and then taken with his mother to Carthage. His place of birth is largely derived from the third part of his full Roman name, Afer, which suggests that he was from the Afri tribe, who originated near Carthage, but there's no certainty for the provenance of this. Some have suggested he was of Berber origin, some that he was from one of the Arabic-speaking tribes in the area. He's described as being dark-skinned, but that's too vague to be useful in trying to define his ethnicity, and his exact ancestry is perhaps not that important. What we can be sure of is that he was a slave, although not how he or his mother came to be in that situation. Rome and Carthage weren't at war at the time, so there's no obvious reasons. It was as a slave that he came to Rome at some point and ended up in the household of Terentius Lucanus, a Munia and Roman senator. The master saw some talent in the young slave, presumably fine manners, intelligence and imagination, and had him educated. He then went further and granted him his freedom, and in gratitude, the newly freed slave took his former master's name and became Publius Terentius Afer. His talents must have been prodigious and obvious, as he soon started moving in august circles in Roman society. That circle of associates included Scipio Africanus the Younger and statesman Gaius Lelius, both of whom were scholarly and intellectual and encouraged Terence in his writing. We know very little about the life of Terence, but here is one significant story. As an aspiring playwright, he was invited to a banquet being held by Cecilius Statius, the most famous comic playwright of his day. The invitation for the lowly ex-slave was procured by the Adeles, the magistrates responsible for theatrical activity in the city, so that Cecilius Statius could pass judgment on the young writer. Terence was placed at the bottom end of the table, but as soon as he read the opening passage from his work in progress, the play Andrea, he was asked to take the seat next to the host. He remained there for the duration of the dinner and afterwards, so that Cecilius Statius could hear more of his work. The two were firm friends from then on. And a small pause here to acknowledge Cecilius Statius, who appears as little more than a shadow in the story of Roman theatre as it's been handed to us. We know of some 42 plays he wrote by titles only, and only a measly 300 lines of text survive in manuscript fragments. That is particularly frustrating, as Cicero ranked him as first among the Roman comic playwrights. As we see it, he operated in Plautus's shadow, but perhaps it's more likely that they shared the same audience with a measure of equality. Horace, who was no fan of Plautus, said Cecilius had dignity, and commented that his plays were extremely popular. Born about 219 BCE in either Gaul, Rome or northern Italy, depending on your source, he could have known an ageing Plautus as a young man and seen his plays in original presentations. But his was another career that was not plain sailing. Later, Terence records that his producer, Ambivius Turpio, was responsible for rescuing Cecilius's career at a time when he would have otherwise been driven from the stage and his art. The exact situation here is frustratingly elusive, But the sense is that Cecilius was being actively and consistently criticised to the point where he was about to abandon playwriting. Terence's connection to Ambivius Terpio came through Cecilius. Terpio is recorded as a promoter and actor working with Cecilius and seems to have turned around his fortunes, presumably by convincing the public that his work was good, whatever these critics said, and did so as an exponent of his work, either as producer or actor or maybe both. It's believed that he also produced and acted in all of Terence's six plays, and continued to promote and act in them after Terence had died. In one play, The Mother-in-Law, he is explicitly identified as delivering the prologue. 
Every suggestion is that they worked as a playwriting producing team, and Terpio was a considerable boost to Terence's prospects as an established figure, putting his weight and reputation behind the work of a new playwright. Terence seems to have had a similarly close and loyal relationship with a musician slave who composed music for him, again, probably for all six plays. As for Cecilius Statius, sadly, beyond these details, we know nothing more of his life. It's possible that Cecilius and Terence ran into the same problem. The paucity of surviving work by Cecilius is a problem here, as we cannot really compare him to Terence or Menander based on just 300 scattered lines, but we do have some commentary from Alius Gellius, who was able to compare manuscripts in detail when he was writing in the second half of the 2nd century CE. He admired the Latin comedies, but found them wanting when compared to Menander's original works. He said... I note the general fact that Cecilius has not tried to repeat, even when he might have done so, some of Menander's brilliant, apt and clever lines, but rather passed over them as if they were of no value, and instead thrown in some farcical stuff. And what Menander took from real life, simple, true and delightful, Cecilius, for some reason, has omitted. The reverence for Menander is striking, but also the implication that Cecilius felt the need to throw in some farce, presumably as a sop to his audience. By his time, had the Hellenising influence become so strong in Rome that among the patrician class, divergence from Greek purity had become unacceptable. That's certainly one reading of this, and it fits with the reception that Terence was to receive from some quarters, as he tried to create something different from both Cecilius and Plautus. It seems that this support and admiration from the elite caused some gossip to be put about regarding the originality of Terence's work. Rumours circulated that his plays were in fact written by his patrons. Nothing remains that comes anywhere near proof of this, but the rumours persisted and dogged his career. And rumours like that would have put Terence in a difficult position. If his supporters were in fact the authors of the plays, then they must have had their reasons for not wanting to be named as such, and, as complicit in the arrangement, Terence could hardly expose them. But then, he could hardly offend them by suggesting they were incapable of writing the plays either. He did, however, address the issue in the prologue to his last play, The Brothers, when he said, Some people who don't have good feelings about our author are saying that some gentlemen of good reputation have been helping him with his plays, in fact, writing the words for him. They think this a serious charge, but our author takes it as a great compliment to be considered the friend and confidant of men who are so loved and admired by the people. Who amongst us has not had occasion to accept their help without reservation, whether that be in times of war, in affairs of state, or in a business matter? So, not exactly a denial, but a clever middle path to try and keep all concerned on side. Scipio the Younger was a key supporter, and quite a young man at the time, probably close to Terence in age, but their situations could not have been more different. He was the son of an established family who had produced generations of venerated military commanders, and soon proved his own worth on the battlefield. Aged only 17, he acquitted himself bravely during the Third Macedonian War. It must have been after his return from that campaign and before he volunteered to go to Spain for the difficult Numantine War in 151 BCE that he met, befriended and supported Terence. By the time he left for Spain, Terence was already a few years dead. Scipio went on to fight in the Third Punic War and was elected consul as the only man believed to be capable of ending the Numantine War that had dragged on. He did end that war in 133 BCE and enjoyed a vibrant political career until his somewhat mysterious death in 129 BCE. The politics of the time with the rise of the Gracchi brothers are not for discussion in this podcast, but enough to say that they could have led to his assassination or suicide. The exact circumstances of his death are uncertain, to say the least. The cultural circle that orbited around him became known as the Scopionic Circle and included, alongside playwrights Terence and Lucilius, the historian Polybius and the Stoic philosopher Panetius, among other poets and writers. The common thread in the group was an appreciation of Greek culture, literature and humanism. Even as a young man, Scipio was certainly rich and powerful enough to help pay for and promote theatre, but there's a lack of evidence about his own literary skills. 
The most likely scenario is that these patrons offered help and constructive criticism to a young playwright who they liked and in whom they saw a prodigious talent. Once again, we will never know for sure, but Terence seems to have been keen to appeal to the patrician set who supported him. The language he used was the refined Latin that this group espoused, and he avoided the crude language, vulgar characters and the situations that other playwrights used to please the masses. He may even have aspired to the greatness of his Greek predecessors, although he would never achieve that. His skills with Latin are particularly impressive, as it was not his native tongue, but he belongs to the group of artists who find clarity in the use of a second language precisely because it was learned and new to them. He was skilled at crafting epigrams, which were sometimes copied from the Greek, and in time became an excellent crafter of plays. He was a good judge of when to simplify a plot, and when to make it more complex. He took Menander as his chief model, so of the six surviving plays, four are based on Menander, with the other two being based on the plays of Apollodorus of Chiristus, who was himself a follower of Menander. Terence rather modestly termed himself as just a translator of Greek plays, but he was truly an adapter, just not quite as freewheeling as Plautus. This may come from the reverence for all things Greek, but also out of necessity. As an ex-slave and new citizen, it would have been unwise to set his plays in Rome and portray the Roman citizens as untrustworthy or duplicitous, particularly as he needed to keep the support of the patricians. To effect the required detachment, he set the plays clearly in Athens and retained Greek names. The audience is in no doubt that this is a non-Roman setting. His particular strengths were for characterisation, which goes well beyond anything found in Plautus and Menander, where characters served the plot and little else. These more rounded characters are achieved through the use of dialogue. Where Menander would have a long monologue, Terence has a lively conversation. Where Plautus would have used an aside or physical comedy, Terence gives us a narrative conversation that progresses the plot and a joke that's more natural to the character and not just inserted for the sake of the belly laugh. In fact, the belly laugh is not a feature in Terence. His forte was the sophisticated, knowing chuckle. For the first time in Greek and Roman comedy, we can perhaps talk of the motivation of characters being a major consideration for the playwright. Dialogue, stage action, entrances and exits are all there to progress the plot and keep up the pace, and because of that consideration, Terence avoids the plot holes that are sometimes found in Plautus. Terence was a meticulous crafter of plays, which give a very different impression from the more flamboyant work of his predecessor. Despite the debt to the Greek, Terence was never tempted to end his plays with the deus ex machina. Such an intervention would not have appealed to his audience, but perhaps more importantly for Terence, it would have simply not fitted with a play that sought to show why and how characters did what they did. It's from these choices that commentators have traced the development of comedy right through to today. Both Plautus and Terence were men of their time, but the change in those few years is significant. Plautus was full of broad physical comedy and colloquialisms that put his work just the wrong side of an invisible barrier that makes appreciation of his style and humour so much more difficult than it is for Terence. This is not to say that we should consider Terence as the start of modern comedy. That doesn't come for several centuries yet. His worldview was probably not that different from Plautus, but his style and sensibilities were just a step closer to our own, and one could argue that he achieves this by going back to the Greek and creating a less Romanized type of comedy. It's quite difficult to imagine these subtler works being presented in the Roman theatre situation, the crowded marketplace or a corner of the Circus Maximus or some other huge venue. Indeed, there are stories of crowds leaving performances of his plays partway through when word spread of an exciting bear fight taking place nearby, and on another occasion it was a gladiatorial fight that distracted his audience. It seems more likely that his plays were performed in private homes for a smaller and more appreciative audience. Villas were being built that could accommodate theatrical performances, either acted out or staged readings, and this seemed a much more likely venue where Terence could be truly appreciated. Despite his good connections, he seems to have had a problem getting his plays into the Lundy Festival, again, perhaps because they were not seen as suitable for the large venue. 
His first surviving work comes from about 166 BCE. The Woman of Andros was not a success when it was first produced. That failure was probably due to the clumsy handling of the plot. Terence was, after all, only in his early 20s at most, so was still fairly green at playwriting, however many lost plays had gone before this one. The play is an adaptation of Menander's play of the same name, with a bit of his Woman of Perinthia added into it. In the prologue, there's a defence against some criticism of the merging of the two plays, suggesting that the prologue was added sometime after an initial production. Terence defends his choices as adapter by saying that many greats who have gone before him have made similar choices, people like Plautus, Ennius and Gnaeus Navius. He points out that there are probably greater errors of his own making in the play, and that the two Menander originals are so similar, essentially they're the same play, that merging them seems a minor fault. He has a point. It's easy to find greater criticisms in the play, which, thanks to his immaturity, leans very heavily on the original and is at best mildly amusing. The plot concerns Simeo, a kindly father who's worried for his son Pamphilius, who feels obliged to acknowledge his illegitimate child who is about to be born to Glycarium, one of the women of Andros of the title. Simeo would prefer his son to marry Philhumina, the daughter of his wealthy neighbour. It's the clever slave Davos who helps Pamphilus to overcome this dilemma, and most of the comedy is derived from his various plans going awry. There are revelations about true parentage that allow for all to be resolved very neatly. What is most notable in the relationship between father and son, slave and master, and husband and wife, is that they are portrayed tactfully and more truthfully than anything we've seen before. Because of this, they lack some of the energy and vigour of similar characters in Plautus, and inevitably, the play is a bit blander for it. His second play, The Mother-in-Law, also had a less than auspicious start. It seems that there were three productions, two of which couldn't hold the audience's attention against the bear-baiting and gladiators that I mentioned previously, before it became a success. There are references to these productions in the fragmentary prologue, which must have been written for a later production. The play is adapted from Apollodorus, one of his fifty or so plays that are now all lost. The plot is familiar. Pamphilus has forced himself on the young Philomena, and later marries her, unaware that she is his victim. She is a central character in the play, but is never seen on stage. When Pamphilus returns from a business trip to find her with a newborn baby, he immediately suspects her of infidelity. Her innocence is proved with the help of the kindly courtesan, Bacchus who numbers Pamphilus amongst her former clients. The eponymous mother-in-law is Sostrata, who becomes embroiled in the concealment of the baby and then torn between accusations from her husband and her son. The recognition scene that reveals the true parentage of the child via, of course, a lost ring, happens off stage. Which I'm sure all sounds very familiar to you now. But for all the tried and tested plot, the picture of family life painted by Terence is remarkably warm and, in some ways, quite modern. The characters ultimately do have the best interests of the young couple at heart and a genuine interest in finding a solution to their problems, rather than manipulating it to their own ends. The play is sentimental, and with very few outright laughs. Once again, we see Terence playing with some of the subtleties of human nature and human characteristics in quite a nuanced way. The self-tormentor, presented in 162 or 163 BCE, is taken from Menander. In the prologue, Terence again feels the need to defend himself against the charge of making unnecessary changes to the originals. He states that the play is faithful to Menander, and he will continue to adapt in this way whatever the critics say. Having defended the dramatist, the prologue then takes on the voice of the actor, commenting on how weary he is of playing the same parts and, as an ageing actor, being expected to fulfil the most energetic roles. It's a plea against typecasting that many of today's actors would still sympathise with, although they probably don't have the problem of being asked to play younger roles from their past that they no longer have the stamina for. It's one advantage or disadvantage of the mask, depending on which way you look at it. The Eunuch is his most overtly farcical play. Written in 161 BCE, it's taken from Menander's The Parasite. Once again, Terence evidently faced criticism and cries of plagiarism, enough to prompt him to the defence in a short prologue. He protests that he was not aware of the previous Latin versions of the source material by Gnaeus Navius and Plautus. 
Now that's difficult to judge, but it seems unlikely. Notwithstanding that these are all stock characters, two of the principals do owe more to the later Latin versions than to Menander. Chiria is a young man of a good family who falls in love with the slave girl Pamphyla. He disguises himself as a eunuch to guard her, but at the prompting of his older brother's slave Parmenio, he forces himself on her during the night. A genuine eunuch is then accused of the deed, much to his bewilderment, and after he is exonerated, Pamphyla discovers that she is in fact a freeborn woman, meaning that Chiria can marry her. The strengths of the play do not come from the young characters and this basic plot, but from the older characters and subplots that revolve around them. Thias is the older courtesan who is trying to restore Pamphyla to her rightful inheritance, while being pestered by Tharso, the begging coward character, and Fedria, the older brother. When she is seemingly forced to choose between them, she opts to keep them both, something to which they both agree. That end, paired with the marriage of the young lovers, might seem ambiguous if not to say cynical to us, but was probably less so to the Roman audience, for whom the youthful activities of men of the upper class were accepted with a large degree of tolerance. Terence was certainly prolific. In the same period, and possibly in the same year as the eunuch, he produced Formio. This is taken from the litigant by Apollodorus and is seen as one of the best examples of Roman comedy as it combines all of the expected elements of mild social satire, intrigue, love, witty dialogue and gentle humour. Although the story is a well-known one, Terence crafted the play in such a way that it is well-paced and the events plausible, resulting in a fresh and lively piece. Formio is the parasite character and the model for many later versions in the 16th and 17th century plays. The impulsive young Antipho falls in love with Fanium, while his father Demipho is away on business. She is poor and orphaned, making her unsuitable, but Formio sees how he can help them out. He goes to court on Antipho's behalf and claims that as a distant cousin, Antipho is obliged to marry Fanium. The point is agreed and the marriage is consummated. When Demipho returns, he is furious. He knows Fanium is no relation and tries to bribe Formio to get rid of the girl. Formio agrees to the plan, but then thinks up means by which he can extract even more money from the old man. Demipho's brother Chamus is also a travelling businessman, which has allowed him to live as a bigamist with two wives. Having returned to his second wife after a long absence, he learned that she had died and her daughter had gone missing. With the help of an old nurse, he discovers that that child is Fanium, now married to his cousin, Antipho. The last part of the play is concerned with how Formio attempts to keep the money he's been paid, even though his intervention is no longer required, and how Chermas attempts to keep knowledge of his second wife from his first, a sharp and shrewish woman. Chermis tries to explain his actions, and his brother Demipho also pleads on his behalf, but ultimately his aggrieved wife can't bring herself to forgive him, and as a calculated rebuke agrees to dine with Formio rather than her husband. That is a very brief outline of a play that has many strands and subplots. The ending is notable for its ambiguity as it lacks the final forgiveness of the errant husband. There are a couple of minor servant characters who explain some of the complicated action and pass moral judgments on the behaviour of the other characters. And once again, there's a leading female character, Fanium, who never appears on stage. As the prologue does not reveal the plot at all, the play probably did have more of an element of suspense than was usual in most Roman theatre. This is a minor feature of Terence more generally, and another reason why his prologues often concluded with an appeal for quiet and concentration from the audience, trying to ensure that the plot would be followed. The Brothers, from 160 BCE, was the last play by Terence. It's based on Menander's play of the same name, with some elements of Champions in Death by De Phyllis added to it. The main theme is a discussion of the best methods of child-rearing, and it's a typically thoughtful piece, verging perhaps more than any other of his plays into the philosophical. It's another play that I'll look at in detail in upcoming episodes. There's a strange air of contemporary criticism that hangs over Terence. As we have seen, something similar went on with his near predecessor Cecilius Statius, which suggests that, where there was criticism, it was very factional and very vocal. Roman behaviour at public events, especially at the games, was driven by factionalism and was partisan by its nature. It's possible that this carried over into the theatre, but we can't tell if the objections were truly artistic, 
or if they were in fact rooted in class, racial or some other social divide. On the one hand, Terence is accused of copying the Greek comedies too slavishly, on another, of changing them about too much. It seems whichever way he went, somebody was not happy with his approach. It's difficult not to conclude that these criticisms were mostly from professional rivals who feared the talents of this rising star and the powerful friendships that he managed to forge at an early stage. There's little consistency in them and, as far as we can tell from this distance, not much to criticise that is unique to Terence. Many other Roman dramatists plundered the Greek legacy. Indeed, as we've repeatedly seen, it was the norm to adapt from the Greeks. The best guess is that these jibes were unfounded, but clearly they hit home enough for Terence to feel that he needed to defend himself in the prologues. A lot of the accusations came from one individual, Lucius Lanuvinius, an older dramatist who seems to have been particularly jealous of or threatened by Terence. We don't know why he felt this so keenly, but his accusation of outright theft of the work of others prompted Terence to respond with, Nothing is said today that has not been said before. Given the Roman way of using Greek plays, that seemed like a reasonable defence, and maybe he was just a bit thin-skinned and oversensitive. One can imagine his more socially confident and secure sponsors telling him not to worry, but equally, it's possible that such criticism might have had an impact on popular success and he felt justified in defending his art. These criticisms may have led to his early death in about 159 BCE. Apparently taking the accusations to heart, he resolved to travel to Athens to become more closely acquainted with the Greek dramatists and Menander in particular. It seems he thought he could create some original works under the close influence of Athens and avoid any accusations of excessive help from his supporters. On the journey back to Rome, the ship he was travelling on was caught in a storm and sunk. There were two versions from there on. Most likely, he drowned and died with the manuscripts, which were many sinking with him. An alternative ending is that he survived the storm, but the loss of his manuscripts broke his spirit and he died soon after. Whichever one we choose to believe, he was 30 or maybe 35 when he died. Following his early death, Terence's reputation was held high by Cicero and Horace, whereas Julius Caesar only thought him worth half of Menander. That might seem a cruel judgement to us, but as we only have very little of Menander's work, and most of that in poor fragments, but an almost complete six works of Terence, it's not really fair for us to judge. In previous episodes, you've already heard how his stylish Latin helped his work survive through the fall of the Roman Empire and onto the medieval period. Partially that was due to his paring back of the plots and crudenesses displayed in Plautus, which allowed medieval Christian clerics to justify reading and copying his works. There is even a story of 10th century nuns adapting and acting in his plays, which is one of the strangest anecdotes I've found in the history of theatre so far. It seems that this abbess, who resided in a royally supported convent in Saxony, had a literary bent and produced several narrative religious poems and historical chronicles in verse, as well as adapting Terence. She turned the plays into Christian moralistic versions, so seemingly well away from the originals. That was just one of the ways that the work survived, as was the use by teachers as good examples of Latin, but there was more to it than that. Terence was also appreciated for the reality in his characters and in the gentle crafting of his plays. He took tentative steps to show real people in situations that were a little more relatable than his predecessors and expected something more from his audience. And that just might have been at the heart of the criticisms he took. As he moved firmly away from the plotine modes of presentation, he got too far ahead of the general audience and couldn't bring them with him. None of the contemporary commentators put it as explicitly as that, so it's difficult to be sure, but for me, this seems the most plausible explanation. A dramatist who was searching for beauty and for subtlety and was ahead of his time. The next episode will be a detailed look at The Self-Tormentor, a play that takes a close look at the father and son relationship and some of the difficulties that that can entail. Terence said it was completely faithful to Menander's original, but we don't have that original to compare it to, so we'll have to take his word for that and look at it from a purely Roman perspective. Please give us a follow on the Twitter account or a like on the Facebook page to join in with the conversations about theatre history and theatre in general. There's a lot of content around Roman history on both platforms, and I do my best to pick out the most interesting and particularly the theatre-related items.
Please support the podcast by signing up for additional audio content at patreon.com or just to say thanks at ko-fi.com. All contributions help to offset the costs of the expanding library of reference books and are gratefully received. And most of all, if you have a moment, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts to help other interested folk find us. If you could do that, you'll have my extra special thanks. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Thank you.